graduate degree in biblical languages. So I've actually gotten to travel to the Holy Lands twice, once to take Hebrew in Jerusalem, and the other time to take a couple of classes on the Biblical Land Study Tour led by Carl Kosart out of Walla Walla University. So I've been very blessed, and I would love to share with you some of the experiences I've had. I hope you'll all be able to go sometime, but if you don't get to go this side of heaven, then it's kind of good to know some of these things, right? And so this is just a real overview. Uh, we can't really get into too many details um, this evening, but if there's interest, I can certainly go into more detail in the future. So I just wanted you to get an overview of of the lands we're talking about, the lands that were relevant really for the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. And so this is what we're looking at here. As you can see, we have at the top, we have Turkey, which was called Anatolia. Um, we have Syria, Assyria, um, Mesopotamia, and then Persia. And then we have Egypt, and south of Egypt is Nubia. So that's the area that we're really talking about. And um, when I went last year, or the previous year, to study Hebrew in Jerusalem, I went to Jordan and Israel, and my husband John joined me at the end, and we went to, we traveled around both of those countries. And this year, I was able to go to Egypt and Turkey as well. So, it was a real blessing. So the first place we went this year was Egypt. So you can see Egypt, if you looked at the previous map, it's down to the left and bottom of all of the other countries. Just to give you some perspective, so it's south of Israel, south and east, I'm sorry, south and west of Israel. And what's interesting too about Egypt is what you call Lower Egypt is Northern Egypt, and what you call Upper Egypt is Southern Egypt. So that's a little confusing, but that's just the way it's been. Um, the pharaohs were usually in control of Lower Egypt, sometimes also in control of Upper Egypt. So, and of course the children of Israel interacted in what we call Lower Egypt, which was Northern Egypt. Um, you can see Memphis there, and um, basically that, that delta that heads into the Mediterranean Sea, and that's really where the children of Israel settled when they were staying in Israel. I mean, I'm sorry, in Egypt. So Egypt, this is what we think of. When we think of Egypt, we think of pyramids and maybe the Sphinx. By the way, that Sphinx is a lot bigger than you think he is. And this is this picture, he's not as big as the pyramids, but this picture is a little better. Um, he's, he's quite big. Um, he's kind of a smaller scale of the pyramids. And something that we usually think about is we usually think the children of Israel built the pyramids, right? Is that what we usually think? Yes, that's, that's what we've all heard, right? Have you all heard this? And maybe thought this, right? Um, but as we look back into history, we realize that the pyramids were built really early on in the dynasties of the pharaohs. And so um, certainly the pharaohs were always builders. They were amazing builders, right? Um, as engineers, they, they did some of the most amazing civil engineering feats among, amongst which are the pyramids. However, those pyramids were there early on, right? So Abraham would have seen those pyramids. Joseph and Moses would have seen those pyramids. There were still monumental building works going on that they continued to do. But just so you kind of have a perspective, those pyramids were there um, early on. So soon after the flood, the uh, Tower of Babel was built and people uh, spanned out and built similar structures in other lands. We also have, as, as really, as you look around Egypt and a lot of these places, there's a lot of images, right? They had worship of, of the gods, and of course the sun god was really big in Egypt. However, the pharaohs usually thought they were gods and usually built big statues to, statues to themselves and had the people worship them as gods. And they usually tried to display themselves 
as being birthed from the gods in some of their artwork we can see um, where they they display themselves as being birthed of the gods because they believed they were divinely called to be pharaohs so you see a lot of iconic imagery around the land of Egypt huge too not just little these people did things big and what's really interesting is they preserved themselves of course in the mummies right why did they do this the Egyptians their whole focus was on the afterlife those pyramids you know what those are those are giant tombs they're giant tombs right so they were so focused on the afterlife and in fact they were meant to align with the stars in such a way as to catapult the occupant into in some cases the belt of Osiris right the middle star and the belt of Osiris they did care very much about the afterlife and they did everything they could to engineer their transport into the afterlife so unfortunately a lot of them didn't know the best way to go to the afterlife did they no of course the lord has enabled a much easier way than building these giant pyramids right uh, if we if we just come to him and surrender to him then we have an open door to the afterlife but they did a lot so what's interesting is they built huge structures huge stones huge structures but when you go and look at the mummies of all the pharaohs which i got to see many of them they are tiny people they are smaller than everyone in this room. They are like only five feet tall. They're really tiny little people. So you have these tiny little people building these giant structures. It was just really interesting. But it was really cool because you could see their hair, their fingernails, you know, the mummification process is really amazing, right? They pull out the internal organs of the body and they basically um, just take the skin and so on and they, they dry it out so much that it preserves, right? Um, basically it's a drying process and it's really dry there in certain portions of Egypt and so that alone helps preserve those mummies okay so is Egypt important in biblical accounts we've kind of already mentioned this but who lived in Egypt Israelites Joseph Jesus yes and who else Moses. Moses yes so I think those are the main ones but it's interesting God actually used this as a refuge for his people at times right he told Abraham to go to Egypt he told Jesus to go to Egypt right so he used it as a refuge this pagan nation who in biblical um, biblical ideology is really a type of the world but he used it as a refuge for his people. So that's very interesting in and of itself. So let's read Exodus 2. Exodus 2, I have verses 5 through 10 here. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name, what? Moses. Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. So why was this baby in the water anyway? They were killing the children. They were, the children. They were afraid these, this people was getting too big and powerful for them, right? And so they thought that by killing the male babies, they could have some control over them. So here's, here's a look at the 18th dynasty of pharaohs. I'm going to zoom in, so don't try to squint your eyes. That is the relevant time period for Moses. Do you notice any similarities with Moses' name here? 
Yes, yeah, so the pharaohs from the 18th dynasty at the time of Moses were named things like Amos or Tutmos, um, Tutmoses I, Tutmoses II. Um, so was Moses in line to be a pharaoh? He absolutely was. He absolutely was. And so does anybody know the name of his stepmother? A Shepsut, yes. And she, you can see her right here on the left, a Shepsut. Um, she was the daughter. Now, now, one thing I want you to know is that in order to preserve the pure bloodline in the times of the pharaohs, they intermarried extensively. And of course, this happened in the time of Adam and Eve too, because the genetic lines were pure and it didn't matter, right? The genes were pure, there wasn't any genetic pollution. Um, but this is a little ways down from Adam, but they were still trying to keep their bloodline pure in the, the pharaoh lineages. So you can see that here. So Hatshepsut married her half-brother, Tutmoses II. So that's her husband. They did not have a son. They only had a daughter. And Tutmoses II actually died early. And he did have a son, but it was by a concubine named Iset. And um, so Tutmoses III couldn't, couldn't rule right away. And so Hatshepsut actually ruled for a while. She was the first female pharaoh and the most prominent one of history. And so that's pretty interesting in and of itself. Uh, Tutmoses III was so young, he couldn't do it. And had Moses not gone running off to the wilderness, he could have become pharaoh, right? But what does Hebrews tell us about Moses? He chose to suffer with the people of God, right? Rather, and did he, did he end up having a much better role than being the pharaoh of Egypt? Egypt was the world power um, during a lot of these times, and yet he could have been, you know, way up there in world leadership, but he's way up there in God's kingdom leadership, right? Um, much better decision. He made a great decision. But just so you can see, he would have fit nicely here into this line of pharaohs. Right, so that was the plan. Um, so Hatshepsut did rule for a while. Um, she was the co-regent of Tutmoses III, but then she became, um, she became the pharaoh. And there was a little conflict there. Women didn't become pharaohs. Um, so that's kind of an interesting story. When Tutmoses III got old enough, he did actually take over from her. This is, this is one of her statutes, Hatshepsut. Moses' stepmom. There is this huge temple to her in southern, the southern part of Egypt, which again we call Upper Egypt. And uh, actually it looks kind of barren right there, but it was a garden in her day. She had trees, and we've seen evidence of this, trees and flowers and such. So it was a very beautiful place. And inside of this temple, she has lots of statues, and some of them were of herself. And all of her images were defaced. So it's thought that Tut Moses III did that maybe towards the end of his reign to wipe out her, um, her leadership, the record of her leadership. And it actually took us a long time in modern times to figure that out, to figure out who she was and, and what really happened. But uh, historians did arrive at that. So we have Moses. Moses went off into the desert and he came back to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And just so you can kind of see, you can see where Goshen is there on the left, in the upper left. So that's where they were located. This is a possible Exodus route. There's many of them on the internet. A lot of people don't like to believe that the Red Sea actually parted, but I like to look at maps where there's a clear path through the Red Sea, um, even though there's not many of those. This is one possible map, one that, that could have been. It puts Mount Sinai somewhere different than the traditional location, but uh, we don't know that for sure. But in any case, you can see that they left Egypt and they moved eastward, right? They moved eastward through the Red Sea. We don't know which arm of the Red Sea they went through, but uh, given the location of Goshen, it may be that they did go through that right arm or the eastern arm. And they made their way up north after they went eastward, and of course they were going north and you can see this what's called the salt sea up there um let me see if i can get the clicker out 
and show you where that is. You can see the Salt Sea here. So north of the Salt Sea is the Jordan River. So this is, would be what they finally crossed to get into the Promised Land, but they wandered in the wilderness for a good amount of time, and it's likely it was this area of the wilderness, um, somewhere in this area. This is Arabia and Midian, where Moses was all of that time. So it's likely that he was, um, you know, down in Arabia or maybe up in this area. Uh, Petra is actually in that region, and he probably went through that area as well. So this is just kind of an idea of what it looked like when Moses exited Egypt with the children of Israel. And so then in our tour, we went from Egypt to Jordan, and Jordan is, is, it is to the east of Israel. You can see Egypt down here. So again, they may have crossed this arm of the Red Sea, come over into Arabia and Jordan area. And so they wandered around here for a while. This is also the land of the, east, the children of Esau, and the children of Lot were in the area of Jordan where Moses and the children of Israel were as well. Okay, so here, I think I have this in the wrong place. Let me look. So here you can see just a little better picture of the Dead Sea, where it is, and where it's in relation to Jordan. Uh, Jordan we have a city in the northern part called Amman and a city in the southern part called Petra. Those are two of the key locations that tourists go these days. And again, uh, it's likely that the children of Israel went to Petra and certainly Amman was pertinent in Bible times as well. Okay, so here is what the um, outlay of how Jordan was, was split up into the children of Esau, which is the kingdom of Eden, Edom, and then the children of Lot, which are Moab and Ammon. So those, those are the people that lived mostly in the land of Jordan, where our tour went next. So Petra, we've all heard of Petra, right? Everybody heard of Petra? That's very popular. Um, it's interesting, as I was touring around, I really thought about, you know, the places that people love to go and love to see and are very iconic, are very pagan. They built these huge pagan monuments, and they've lasted throughout all time, right? And so that's why it's interesting. But let's keep in mind, these are pagan monuments, even though they're, they're very cool. Um, the things that are not left behind in stone are a much better reflection of what we should keep our eyes on. But it, it's fun to go see these. So this is the monastery uh, in Petra. It's a little bit of a hike from the valley. It's, it's an amazing place to go. They've, they've carved out of these rocks all, all kinds of very cool edifices. Um, so I've, I've been there a couple times. My husband went with me the first time, and uh, it's a really neat place to travel around. Just so you know, it's thought that Paul, remember when the, in the New Testament when it says that Paul went to Arabia? It's thought that he hung out at Petra for a while, which was the capital of the region at the time, and he would have had a lot of influence there. And yet that would have been a good place to kind of hide out from the Jews while he was really um, getting schooled in the ways of the Savior. And so it may be that the Apostle Paul spent some time here. That's what we tend to believe. So in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it says, And it came to pass... After the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon. Now, who are the children of Ammon again? Whose children are those? Lot. Lot's children. And besieged Rabbah. Rabbah is the old name for modern-day Ammon in Jordan. But da David tarried still at Jerusalem. This is, of course, the beginning of the Bathsheba story, but we won't go into that right now, at least the sordid portions. Um, but we're going to go to the end of the story, which talks about what happened as a result of all of this. And so, same chapter, 2 Samuel 22. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. Remember, Joab's leading the battle that's taking place in Ammon, 
um, at, at Rabbah, the capital city there. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field, and we were upon them even unto the entering of the gate. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So this was the demise of Uriah, directly ordered by David. Um, they took him up to the wall of the city, and then they fell back from him so that he was going to get hit um, because David was committing adultery with his wife. So that's a really sad story. Um, but the way they built cities back in Bible times is they, they were all on hills. Now, whether it was a natural hill or not, at the beginning, it, it always ended up being a hill because um, even if the city started on a plain, they would build the old cities on top of new ones and they would get a mountain, it's called a tell. And so, um, and at the, at the top of the mountains, they would call it the Acropolis. And so this is the Acropolis or the citadel on top of, it, on top of this hill in Amman, which used to be Rabbah in Jordan. And so this is the area right outside of this mound where Uriah got killed on David's command. So that was a pretty significant event that happened in Jordan. And so there's some other really interesting locations in Jordan. Actually, a lot of things happen on mountains in the Bible, right? Whether or not a city is on a mountain initially, a lot of interesting things happen on mountains. And I'd like you to notice here a couple of important mountains. We have Mount Nebo. Does anybody remember what Mount Nebo is? Moses died on Mount Nebo. God gave him a vision of the promised land and he couldn't go over the Jordan River, right? Because he got angry, um, struck the rock, didn't follow God's command and made it sound like he was delivering the children of Israel, right? And so he, he got a vision though of the land of Israel from the top of Mount Nebo. And so it's pretty cool to think about this and when you're on the top of Mount Nebo, it's, it's, it's even um, more powerful because as you see, it's right here on the eastern side of the Jordanian Valley. This is the Jordan River right here. It flows into the Dead Sea. And of course, nothing flows out of the Dead Sea. So Dead Sea is here. The Sea of Galilee is actually up north here. And this, the Jordan River flows down from there to the Dead Sea. But you can see that from Mount Nebo, Moses was able to take a look over into the land of Israel, right? And we see Jerusalem and Bethlehem and and Jericho, some of our favorite places, right? So he could see from the top of Mount Nebo. Another place I'd like you to notice is another mountain, Macarius. Macarius. Um, this was a mountain fortress. And um, we'll talk about that a little more in a second. I just wanted you to see. I hope you guys like maps as much as I do. I like to actually see where things are. Amen. So Macarius, um, again, that's a fortress in Jordan. This is what it looks like. So you're going and you just see this mountain and you can climb up this road that goes around and get to the top and you see these ruins on top. And in fact, here's what an aerial view looks like. You can actually see these ruins. So this is where John the Baptist was imprisoned. This was one of Herod's palaces. He had many. Um, Herod was a great builder. Herod the Great, that is. And so many palaces, and so John the Baptist was imprisoned here. This is where we believe Salome danced for him. In fact, we found the courtyard where we believe she danced for King Herod, and he said he'd give her up to half the kingdom. And what did she say she wanted? John the Baptist beheaded, so unfortunately that probably happened here at Macarius. Sadly. Okay. And now here we're back at Mount Nebo. This is a sign on the top of Mount Nebo, so you can see. It's kind of hazy in the distance, but you can see the locations that are visible from the top of Mount Nebo. You can see the Dead Sea, Hebron, uh, Bethlehem. We can see Jericho. So we can see a lot of the locations. It's pretty cool. It really, it really uh, impacted the kids that I was with emotionally a lot to start to see the biblical stories unfold, right? When you can start to see these places and you're in the same place that the patriarchs were, it's very powerful. 
I had the same experience. I was actually on the other side of the valley first, Mount Scopus, um, in Jerusalem, looking over. And I could see the lights of Jericho, and I looked over and saw Mount Nebo. And so I had that same experience, but I was actually on the other side of the valley we looked at um, a minute ago. I was over here. Where's Jerusalem? I was over here in Jerusalem looking this way and saw all these things. I saw the lights of Jericho and the Dead Sea and, and Mount Nebo. And it was a powerful, it's just a powerful thing when you can see all of that history coming together all at once. But it's smaller than what you think it is. We're from America. America's huge. This is actually a pretty small country. And so things are a lot more compacted than you might think they are. Okay, so then the children of Israel, after Moses passed away, they crossed over the Jordan River, right? They crossed over the Jordan River. So this is the Sea of Galilee. This is the Jordan River. This is the Dead Sea. So they crossed over somewhere here. It's a lot smaller today than what it was then, the Jordan River, because today they realize that nothing is going to live that flows into the Dead Sea. So they try to divert all the water. It's just a tiny little creek um, that runs into the Dead Sea now. But it was probably a much bigger river back in the day, and so they crossed. We know that, that they went to Jericho pretty straightway, so they probably crossed somewhere right here and then headed over into Jericho. So here's a look at the land of Israel. So the land of Israel, as it would have been back in Bible times, we have the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. And remember, some of the tribes did not, they wanted to settle on the eastern side of the Jordan River, right? And so some of them settled here. So you'll notice that there's some of the land that's on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Okay, so here, once again, is that look at, at the Dead Sea. We have the Jordan River flowing all the way down here. And so this area right here is where we're at right now. And actually, that's where Jesus was baptized, we believe, is right here in this area by where they crossed the Jordan River. We believe it was right uh, south there. We believe that's where John the Baptist was baptizing. Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that, but I won't go into that right now. Um, but again, it's a tiny mud puddle right now. But when I was there, we did have a baptismal ceremony. Th these are three pastors here that were along on the trip. And so um, you see Brant Berglund, he's baptizing for the first time a girl that had never been baptized before. So that was very cool. Um, and this is Carl Kosart who led the tour and Chad Washburn. Um, they did explain to us that the baptism of John was not, it was just a baptism of repentance. It wasn't a baptism of, of conversion and a new life, really. Because when we're baptized as Christians, we die under the water and we're resurrected to a new life in Christ, right? Um, so they, they said that the baptism of John was more of a baptism of repentance. And so a lot of people were baptized with that and they just dunked them straight down as opposed to the lay down and get up um, method because all of us can, can repent at any point in time. But there were several students, I think at least two or three, that had a first time baptismal experience. And um, that was really cool. I will tell you though, that the mud was really deep. Let me show you how deep it was. It was all the way up to here. <laughs> so it was clay, but it was all the way up to above my knees. So it's, it's very uh, deep mud there in that uh, southern part of the Jordan River. So um, then Jesus, as we know, did a lot of his ministry up around the Sea of Galilee. So in Matthew 11, verses 20 through 24, it says, Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, now notice, three cities here, Chorazin. Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. 
and thou, Capernaum, or Capernaum, as I like to say, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. So why does Jesus call out these three cities? Does anyone know? Evil practices. Yeah, well, so they're, they're actually really tiny towns and um, they were in Jesus' day. If we look here at a map of the Sea of Galilee, which again is, is near the northern part of the Jordan River, notice that the Jordan River does, does uh, initiate north of the Sea of Galilee. However, um, it does flow through there. And um, the cities that, that we just saw mentioned are Chorazin or Chorazin, Capernaum and Bethsaida. You see those three cities up here? Right there. Everybody see those? That was where Jesus did a lot of his ministry, right? Peter lived in Capernaum. So this is where Jesus did a lot of his ministry. That's why he called those cities out because he was the son of God. He was ministering there and there was still a lot of unbelief. But they are tiny towns. When we got there, we went up and sat on a mountain and overlooked this valley and Dr. Cosart had us really think about the scope of Jesus' ministry. It was really small. For most of his ministry, he was ministering to a few tiny towns. And we just think about that today. Look at the Apostle Paul's ministry, right? The Apostle Paul had a huge ministry. So it's very interesting to think about the God of the universe thought it was worthwhile to come and minister in those three tiny towns for most of his public ministry you know, that was his plan and that he didn't come to reach all the people in the world or a lot of people, right? He had a very specific work. He was largely training those 12 disciples that they could go out and they could do a greater work, right? So that's really amazing if you think about it. So if you, if you have a Bible study group and there's only two or three people coming and you're thinking, oh, there's supposed to be 10 or 12 here, you know, what am I doing? But think about Jesus. You know, he wasn't thinking about numbers. He was just ministering to a few small towns. So here's a look at Capernaum. Uh, this is where Peter lived, and you can see some of the ruins there. Notice that the houses are built out of black. You see that black basalt rock that the houses are built out of, that the town was built out of. So that's pretty cool right there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. There's a fish that they call St. Peter's fish. It's a big red fish. When I was waiting in there, they came up to me. But uh, they say that they, those fish are only around this part of the area because of the natural springs that flow into the lake. And so that's probably why the disciples fished here so much, uh, because those fish were concentrated there. So that's pretty cool as well. They're beautiful fish. Okay, so Jesus spent most of his time um, in the Sea of Galilee. He came from Nazareth to be baptized down uh, by Jerusalem, and then he went back up to Galilee. But as we know, he did go back to Jerusalem again, right? For his final week, he was in Jerusalem. This is what the city of Jerusalem looks like today if you're looking at it from the Mount of Olives, right? So um, it's a pretty big city. You can see this is the wall of the old city. It's not exactly the wall that was there in Jesus' time. Um, it's similar. It was much smaller in the time of David. But so here's the wall. You see this right here. Does anybody know what that is? It's actually the Dome of the Rock. It's the third holiest site in Muslim thinking. Um, it is where, about where Solomon's temple used to be, right? And um, the temples of Jerusalem, that's about where they used to be. But um, this is what's on Temple Mount today. It is still a really neat place to go to. It's really amazing. There's this huge platform that Herod the Great created um, upon which this um, Dome of the Rock sits. So that's Jerusalem. I wanted you to see what the city of David looked like because it's much, much smaller 
than the full city of Jerusalem. So on the left here, you can see what the city of David is compared to all of the rest of, of um, Jerusalem. And so it's a much smaller part. And this is what it probably looked like back in the time of David. Here's the palace. Here's the temple. And there's just a few small houses here. You can see how if David was roaming about his palace at night, he could have easily seen Bathsheba because it's on a hill and he could see the roofs of all the other houses, right? So um, just so you kind of get an idea of what the city of David looked like. It was just a small portion of what we call modern Jerusalem today. So speaking of the city of David, there was a king named Hezekiah. Everybody remember him? So Second Chronicles 32 starting in verse 2, says, And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come, by the way, Sennacherib was from Assyria, think Nineveh, they were not very friendly. And when, when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come, and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains, which were without the city, and they did help him. So there were gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land saying, why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? And then if we jump down to verse 30, it says, this same Hezekiah also stopped the upper watercourse of Gihon and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David and Hezekiah prospered in all his works. So if we go back to our view of the city of David there, what Hezekiah did was he built an extra wall around the edge of the city in preparation, and he also built a tunnel. So the Gihon Spring is probably over here, right over here. We could say probably uh, right about here somewhere. And he built a tunnel all the way, so it basically went all the way under the city and came out on the other side. So he built this tunnel to funnel this Gihon Spring under the city, so that it was because it was on the outside of the city, so that the water wouldn't be available to the Assyrians, right? So really they were preserving their water source and protecting it from the enemy so they could handle a long siege, right? And as you can see also, um, you can kind of see that Jerusalem is on a hill and it's surrounded by valleys. So um, it was a hard city to get into, right? Um, David had a little trouble getting into the city, but it's thought that he came in through some tunnels that were carved out to get water from the Gihon Spring um, earlier. So Hezekiah carves this tunnel. This is really cool. There's so many cool civil engineering feats um, from the pyramids of Egypt to Hezekiah's tunnel that I saw. So Hezekiah's tunnel carved through, by the way, everything is rock there. Jerusalem sits on a huge rock, a solid rock. And so Hezekiah, when he carved this tunnel, he carved it through solid rock all the way under the city, right? So it's, it's really amazing. He had, he had to do it in a hurry because the Assyrians were coming. So he had people start on both sides and they, they came and met in the middle and it's pretty close. You can see where they met. It's just a little bit off in the middle of the tunnel. So it's very cool. There's a little water that flows through the tunnel. Most of the time it's only about ankle or mid calf deep. Um, but you know, what's amazing to me about this story is that Hezekiah made all of these amazing preparations. Just amazing engineering feats. Even today, we're not sure if we could carve this tunnel as well as he did at that time with the tools that we have, right? It's that much of a challenge. And, um, you know, he did all of this, but when Hezekiah, or when um, Sennacherib did come to attack, he went straight to the Lord. He said, we have we have no strength in ourselves. There's, there's, we, there's no hope for us unless the Lord fights for us, unless the Lord helps us. <clears throat> so even though he did all this preparation, he didn't take confidence in his preparations or in, in his works. He had only confidence in the power of God, right? And what did God do for them? God fought for them. God fought for them. God single-handedly fought for them and destroyed the Assyrians and um, it was an amazing situation. So, but this reminder of Hezekiah's tunnel is, is just really cool to me, how God has worked with his people, and um, Hezekiah was a godly king. So I have another scripture here. Um, this, for me, is the most powerful place in all four countries that I went to, this place. So Matthew 26, starting with verse 36, says, 
Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Thus said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. This is the most powerful moment in history. And there is no big monument there, right? There's just some really old olive trees. Maybe some of them saw Jesus. That's the most powerful moment. We can go to the pyramids. We can go to the temples in Petra. We can go to the Greek ruins in Turkey. But um, we can go to all the cathedrals built over all of the holy sites. Notice I'm not showing you those, but there's a lot of them. But none of those places has the value of this place. Amen. Right? The Garden of Gethsemane. Because that is where he surrendered already after having fought this fight with Satan all this time through God's power. He came to that last little bit, and he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to be separated from the Father. But he did it, didn't he? So, so that, for me, was such a powerful place. Um, not because of the place, but because of what happened there. So the Garden of Gethsemane, a, a wonderful spot still. And actually, of all the cathedrals, it is the most subdued one, and so they got that right. So then from Israel, we went to Turkey. Anatolia is what it was called earlier. And so Turkey is an important place in biblical history. For one thing, Mount Ararat is in that region. So potentially there is or was uh, an ark on that mountain. And, um, and in Turkey, Paul did a lot of ministry. And actually, John did as well. He was exiled right off the western coast of Turkey. And so a lot of things happened here. Um, on our trip, we actually went to Istanbul. Does anybody know what the old name or the previous name of Istanbul was? Constantinople. Constantinople. So that has important roots, right? We had Rome and we had Constantinople. Um, but it, they call it Istanbul now. So Istanbul, we actually got to go to this place called Cappadocia. Notice there's fairy chimneys there. That was really cool. They have some underground um, churches that we were able to see and some cool rock formations. But the focus of our trip in Turkey was really right over here in this area. What's, what's in this area over here on the western side? Say it louder. Yes, the seven churches. We see one of them here, Ephesus. Actually, this is one too. Does anybody know which one this is? That's the modern name, Izmir. Smyrna. So Izmir is built up around uh, Smyrna. So here's a, a close-up of these. So this is the important area here. So we have Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Izmir, which was what again? Smyrna. Smyrna. We have Philadelphia and Ephesus and Laodicea. We also have Hierapolis. Was that important? It was. That wasn't one of our seven churches, but that was actually really important. It was located near... Laodicea, Colossae was actually also located near Laodicea, and we'll talk about that a little later. Okay, so the seven churches of Turkey, um, or of Revelation, shall we say. Um, so, so tell me, where do we find the scripture about these in the Bible? Revelation. Revelation. Okay. So in Revelation 1, verse 11, it says, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, 
and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So who wrote this? The Apostle John, the longest lived apostle, right? And the only one that we know of that may have died a natural death, right? Um, let me ask you another question. See these seven cities? Who evangelized this part of the world first? Paul. So how many of these cities did he go to? That's right, Ephesus. Yeah, Ephesus. Um, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Right? Yeah, so Ephesus was the only one. He spent quite a bit of time in Ephesus. So here is Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus is the best excavated of these cities and uh, very interesting. There's this roadway you can walk that, that winds down the hill. By the way, Turkey is beautiful. Lots of mountains, it's, it's very pretty. I'm from Colorado and sometimes I felt like I was in Colorado. So it's a very beautiful location. This is the library at the bottom of the hill, right here. Um, it's, it's one of the, the most notable features of Ephesus. What I wanna say about all of these towns is that for the most part, they all had a theater. They all had pagan temples, right? Um, and they all had places where they would meet for business. They would call that the agros. Um, so they all had these similar features and they are more or less excavated and more or less reconstructed. Um, but they all had, what you could really see is, um, this really had a lot of Greek architectural uh, influence still, but it, they were really pagan. You know, these cities were, were really pagan. We're studying the book of Ephesians this quarter, aren't we? And what's, what's one of the things that happened in, the, in Paul's ministry there in Ephesus? Yeah, you had the goddess Diana, right? And, and, and the silversmith got upset. Also, you had the burning of all of the books um, of, of basically witchcraft, we could say, and, and these types of things. So there were a lot of things that went on and a lot of things that the apostles had to confront and um, the disciples had to confront that, that we don't tend to think about. Um, so, so that's Ephesus. And a lot of these cities are um, either they're completely abandoned or they're in the midst of a bigger metropolis of, of city that's grown up around them. And, and like I said, the city grows on top on top layers like a cake, you know, newer layers on top, older layers on bottom. And so to get down to the ruins, a lot of times they have to tear out the new houses and dig down um, to even find those ruins. So this is the case of Smyrna. You can see that um, they haven't uncovered all of the ruins there, but um, that's surrounded by a lot of more modern um, facilities. We have Pergamum. Pergamum is a beautiful location on a hill. Um, what you have here is a temple. I don't remember which, whose temple this was, um, but it was, it was very scenic. So this is Pergamum. Thyatira was another one that um, there's really very little of it that's excavated, but it's in the middle of an urban area. And so there's a few pieces that you can go look at for Thyatira. Sardis, as you notice, is a very beautiful location. Here's um, another temple that we can see that um, is remains from Sardis. And here we have Philadelphia. Philadelphia, there's so little left that this is really um, from the Byzantine area, this era, this is a Byzantine church, so it's after biblical times, but um, this is the main remains that you can see today in Philadelphia. 
And finally we get to Laodicea. Laodicea, that's what we all wanted to see, right? That's what we're, um, we know is most similar to us probably is Laodicea. So in Laodicea, it's got an interesting location. Um, if we look at a map here, you can see that it's situated between Hierapolis and Colossae. Does everybody see that? So, and actually, um, those three cities were evangelized by Epaphras. Um, he came and talked to Paul and went back and evangelized those three cities. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting situation. So, we'll look at Hierapolis first. We actually went to all of these places as well. So, Hierapolis is, you've got some ruins there. It's an old city. But there's also a very interesting feature. When you're driving up on the mountains and you're looking across the valley, you can see this huge white formation across the valley. And when we got up close, we're looking at it and it's these springs, it's these huge hot springs, right? And it just goes all over the side of this mountain. And so you can see um, that the water flows down and stays in these pools and then dribbles down and flows in the, it's, it's just a beautiful location. They actually let you wade in um, the very pools at the top. They let people wade in those. So we got to go wade in those. And then you can go out and you can go to the ruins of Hierapolis. We actually got to drink some of this water. Does anybody here like seltzer water? Does anybody drink seltzer water? Anybody ever had it? So that's basically what it is. It's mineral water. It's bubbly. It's naturally carbonated and it's naturally mineralized, right? A lot of the kids didn't really want to drink it because it's kind of warm and kind of tastes different than what they're used to, but it was amazing. So this nice natural spring water, and of course they felt like it had a lot of healing properties, right? Not just drinking the water, but um, the mud and bathing in the pools. By the way, one thing I forgot to mention, all of those ruins, they all have bathing facilities, right? You all have heard of Turkish baths, right? Well, that's kind of a modern thing. But those are built on ancient building or on ancient bathing practices. Even Herod the Great, on top of those mountains, he would have his bathing facilities, right? These very complicated bathing, and they had indoor plumbing. So don't think where we've got something new. Some of those places had indoor plumbing. So anyway, uh, but they felt that these these um, waters were very healing. So Hierapolis was associated with healing and people would come there for healing. Now these waters would flow down. And guess where they flowed to? Laodicea. They were hot waters. What temperature were they by the time they got to Laodicea? They were lukewarm. So Colossae is, is really an unexcavated mound. It, uh, there's a few stones that they pulled out, but they haven't really done any excavation there. But it was known for its cold springs. Colossae had the cold springs. So Hierapolis, the hot springs. Colossae, the cold springs. In between, Laodicea with, was left with the lukewarm overflow from Hierapolis, right? So that helps us out as we think about our scripture here from Revelation 3 about the church of Laodicea, starting with verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold, Colossae, nor hot, Hierapolis. I would that thou art cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So actually, Laodicea was also known for, um, back in those days, making cloth was really hard, and getting it to be a certain color was really hard. They were known for their white cloth that they produced, and they did have a particular kind of eyes have that they 
produced as well. So this, this scripture was written um, because of their spiritual condition, but, but using some of the things that were um, common to their region. But I think that hopefully this scripture speaks to us today, right? Um, hopefully all of us can look at ourselves and say, where for the grace of God would I be, right? I need, I need gold, and I need ISAB, and I need your white raiment. I need his robe of righteousness. Do you know what that gold is, by the way? Does anybody know? What does that gold represent? Faith that works by love. And, of course, the righteousness of Christ and ISAP so we can spiritually see those things which are not temporal but are eternal, right? So hopefully you'll join me in wanting to be one of those people that has that gold and ISAP and white robe that we need, right? So what have I learned? I learned that God's people have greatly impacted history, that they found refuge in pagan nations, that our decisions... Let's think of Abraham and David and Moses, can have profound long-term consequences. That God has worked powerfully throughout history amongst the pagan nations, bringing his people in and leading them out. That Jesus made the utmost sacrifice and ministered to a small group of people that had a much greater, greater reach of souls than his earthly ministry physically contacted. I know that's a long sentence, but it's my way of saying, you know, Jesus ministered mainly to three small towns. Look at what Paul ministered to. But it's not about, it's not about numbers in a certain time with him. It's about numbers ultimately, right? It doesn't matter whether you plant the seeds or whether you reap the seeds or whether you water the seeds. What matters is that that process moves forward, right? Jesus modeled that for us. He modeled that it shouldn't, the numbers shouldn't matter to us. And that Paul and John worked together to impact the Asian churches significantly. So, so many things I've learned. Most of all, that what Jesus did for me in that tiny little country and what he did throughout his people throughout history is amazing. And he has used the United States of America, the second holy land, to do a great Protestant work, right? This is the land of the free. We need to really value our liberty, don't we? We're more free than they are in Israel right now, right? There's some freedom there, but we're more free than they are. And so we need to really appreciate the work that God's done through his people in the United States of America, the second holy land. I'm always grateful to come home and realize what the Lord is doing here, even though it's fun to go and see what he did there. So hopefully we'll all keep our eyes open for what he's doing here, what he's doing around us all the time. Finally, here's a picture of my husband and I on, um, by the Dome of the Rock on Temple Mount. Um, you notice my clothing is a little bit different there. That's because whatever I had on that day, and I did dress modestly the whole time I was there, um, but I probably had a shirt that came down to here, and you have to have your arms completely covered if you're female. Um, John didn't because he's a male. They'll give you a shirt and a skirt to wear. So that shirt and skirt were given to me before I could enter the Temple Mount area so that I was dressed modestly um, with, with the Muslim um, code, even though, I, like I say, I, I tended to be really modest when I was there anyway. Um, it wasn't quite enough. That was very hot, by the way, to wear up there, just so you know. <laughs> those, those materials are not breathable. But it, it was an amazing time. And, and think about what used to be on that temple mount, right? Actually, the Shekinah glory used to dwell in that place. So that was a powerful place to be, just to be there and think about the things that have happened there as well. Well, thank you for joining me on this journey. Certainly, uh, there are a lot of details that we brushed over, but that kind of gave you the overview of where I went and some of the things I learned. And I'm always happy to talk about more details if you're interested. Thank you so much for coming out. Shall we end with a word of prayer? Well, Lord God, you have worked so greatly through history, um, through the Bible lands, Lord, through your people, um, we're so grateful that when Jesus died, the gospel went to all of the Gentiles, and we're grateful for the work that has happened with the Protestant Reformation and the United States of America. 
And Lord, I pray that each one of us would be faithful ambassadors for you where you've called us to be, that we would realize the great work that you've done in our lives and the life that we have, that we can share with others, that we can be part of this um, gospel continuum that you have started and continues throughout time until Jesus comes. Lord, please help us to be ready and to prepare others for Jesus' soon coming. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, happy Sabbath. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.